From the big 89, the beat goes on. 89 WLS. Oh, one beautiful day. Good morning. 8.35, L.S. Most Music Time. Clark Weber's show for Tuesday morning, and Brooke Benton's next. People like to tell you. John Rook came to WLS as operations director with a highly sophisticated approach to programming. A scientific precision and control never before attempted in the Chicago market. So I monitor constantly, and I dictate into a tape recorder the things that I find wrong. And I can always tell when a song is being played out of category, or when an engineer misses a cue. I listen for things you'd never even notice. John Rook has been called the world's greatest program director by those familiar with his great contributions to the radio industry. In what turned out to be his final interview, we had a lengthy conversation on his life and times. What does the term radio mean to you? It means it's about the only medium that immediately you can reach the public. You don't have to wait to be printed. You don't have to wait for film. No other media other than the broadcast provides that I know of anything as fast or quicker than and, and really a, a huge audience yet. Radio is still, though they have tried to bury it ever since AM Stereo, it's still doing quite well. The problem is that the guys that bought all the stations and overpaid for them uh, will never make enough revenue to pay those off. How do you think that satellite radio has changed the game? The satellite is interesting. Uh, I have hit parade radio, and it's uh, on the Internet, but I don't pay much attention to uh, Sirius or to, uh, if you will, XM. Why not? Uh, first of all, why should I pay for it <laughs> when I can get it free uh, and, and get even more so with uh, with the Internet and Wi-Fi radio? Almost all of my listening I do on Wi-Fi radio, uh -huh. and I see no reason to, to log in. I remember when Lee Abrams uh, uh, was creating and finding XM, okay. uh, he sent me a free re receiver, I guess several years of subscriptions free. I spent maybe two weeks listening, and I didn't find anything that was as strong as what I can get on Wi-Fi radio. Right, right. You could start anywhere in assessing your career. Why did you get into radio? Well, I'm very fortunate in that I left uh, high school in, uh, in Nebraska. I graduated and immediately went to uh, Southern California. Okay. But I slept on the park benches there on the Pacific Palisades in Santa Monica for a week and a half until I finally found a job and found a place to live. And uh, I say that because can you imagine staying on the Pacific Palisades on a park bench today? Uh, they don't even allow you near it. It isn't safe. But 1953, 55 it was. So I did that. I got a job at Sears and Roebuck right down the street in Santa Monica on the loading dock. One day I got tired of that job, maybe three, four months into it. I decided to go to the beach. I walked down to the beach and by happenstance ran into Burt Lancaster. And he introduced me to Maurice Kozlov. And Maurice Kozlov introduced me to the Pasadena Playhouse. And I went to classes with James Dean and Natalie Wood and uh, John Saxton and Salminio. And then uh, uh, out of nowhere, I met Eddie Cochran, who was uh, just starting out as a rock artist. Wow. And was in a couple films that on the same lot that we were on. I went to lunch with Ross Fagsarian, whose stage name was David Seville. Of the Chipmunks, yes. And David Seville and I were sitting at the restaurant, nice restaurant, right on Sunset, in fact. And uh, in came Tennessee Ernie Ford. Of course, wow. Tennessee Ernie Ford was huge then and uh, he came and sat at our table because he knew David and he said what's your friend do and he said he's a starving actor <laughs> and he said are you really in it for the long run I said not really I said I don't think I could take the weight to do one scene five and six times maybe even more that would drive me crazy and it was driving me crazy and he said you know if I were a young man your age, what I'd do today, I said, what? He said, I'd get into radio. He says, you know, it beats everything else in immediacy. They hear you immediately. There's no wasted time on radio. And he said, and above all, all of the guys on radio today 
are moving over to television. It's wide open. So I talked to Eddie Cochran about it. He agreed. I should see what I could do. And before long, I was on the air in Newcastle, Wyoming. <laughs> now, who were the radio stars of that day? Los Angeles. Disc jockeys were on the air there before anyone else even heard of them. I mean, Al Jarvis and uh, Peter Potter and people like that were on the air, even with television shows. And they were introducing new artists, new records, and and uh, people would come and uh, perform on their shows. They were they were big. Uh, there was a couple in New York uh, that stood out, but uh, really it was the 60s at the uh, start of uh, really, I guess, the transistor radio. Uh, that, that radio changed, and now music became very important on it, and disc jockeys were hired by the dozens to fill in on those stations that normally used to have network programming on them. You were also a writer at one time, right? Well, I, that's what I thought I was going to be when I graduated from high school. My high school annual said that I was probably going to wind up editor of my local paper. <laughs> uh, I wrote in high school for the Omaha World Herald and the Rapid City Daily Journal. I went to Gearing, Nebraska with the Gearing Courier. It got to Southern California. Well, I know why I went to apply at the Evening Outlook in Santa Monica, and they didn't even take my application. Your first job in radio, which one was that? I was on the West Coast, and I returned to Nebraska, where I'd lived, and uh, I can only tell you like it was, okay? <laughs> oh, okay, that's all I want. <laughs> when I returned home, uh, uh, my father, who I never had a good relationship with, uh, asked me, what the hell are you doing here? You're old enough to be on your own, and I said, yes, I know that. And within three days, uh, I had heard of a opening at a radio station in Newcastle, Wyoming. 120 miles away. So I called and they said, yes, they had an opening. And so my stepmother and I uh, drove there and uh, I was interviewed and uh, they said, have you had any uh, training in, in radio? I said, I think so. <laughs> they said, well, we have an opening from six in the morning until noon. And the same person has to do the House of Wax now, which is uh, in the evening between 7 and 10 when we sign off. And I didn't ask how much they were going to pay or anything. I said, I'm your man. I took the job. And I mimicked what I had heard in Southern California, if you will, stealing things that I had heard on the air there mm -hmm. for about a month and a half, two months. And then I started uh, feeling my oats and I started taking my own. I didn't. I, I became Johnny Rowe. We came from a generation where we played the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you check it out, it was number one there in the 60s. We played uh, the McGuire Sisters. We played Vaughn Monroe. We played uh, Chuck Berry. We played Elvis Presley. We played country. Uh, the, the Everly Brothers, Elvis, that was all considered country to start. But it was all mixed together. We didn't give a name to it. Please Help Me, I'm Fallen by Hank Lachlan. Yes. 1957, what are, number one record. It was. Well, you, well, you ain't going to play it? When I got to Chicago at WLS, the number one thing they said to me was, what did you notice right away? I said, I noticed right away that the number one record in the entire nation was not on the playlist. <laughs> and when I asked why, I was told, oh, it's too Negroid. And the number one record was Aretha Franklin and Respect. And they were playing the other ones that didn't sell on Columbia, right? Yeah, he was playing album cuts. So that was the first thing I did, was put the damn record on the air. <laughs> it isn't often what you put on the air, it's what you keep off the air, though. You have to keep in mind, why did the listener tune here? Why did the listener tune into an all-talk station? Mm -hmm. Why does he tune into country? Well, because he likes it. <laughs> so so why don't we be satisfied with the fact that he likes what he's tuning into and not try to clutter it up? So I think that what you put on the air, you have to give a lot of thought to, and I think the talent that you hire have to understand what you're striving for. 
the guys I hired understood exactly. I didn't have to. We didn't even have jock meetings. The guy we pass them in the hall. I here's what they're doing today. I give them a call on the phone. I say here's a quick update. Uh, they had their own style. I had their. That's the reason they got the job. Hell, all I had to do is give them a little tip here, a little tip there, and they and they delivered. And it's it's like a racehorse. You don't put a bit in a racehorse's mouth. If the guy's uh, that good that you're going to have him in Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, uh, th- th- let him perform. Now imagine how nice that is to have a radio station that has five or six talents on it, and they all have a different bit. They all they don't sound like each other. In Los Angeles, take a look at Bill Drake's uh, uh, cage today. They had Humble Harv, uh, uh, Real Don Steele, Robert mm-hmm. W. Morgan. None of them sounded like the other. All those guys. That, uh, Loman, do you recall Loman and Barkley? I do, actually. Probably the greatest morning crew I've ever worked with in my life. They, they just were brilliant, and they never made a note <laughs> of each anything. They, they, they. Al Oman would show up and basically take the show over. Uh-huh. Roger was a straight man, and every single minute of it was hilarious and funny. And when we, when, when I became the consultant at KFI, it was an old dog station. No one wanted KFI. That even lost the Dodgers. They had nothing going for them. They were the fifty thousand watt Clear Channel station one of the strongest, if not the strongest, in America. And it was doing a 1.8 in Los Angeles. When I went to KFI, you had to make a change subtly. It couldn't be immediately become a top 40 station, the new KFI, because the ownership in Atlanta didn't want a top 40 station on KFI. What's the typical personality of a DJ, in your opinion? Oh, God, every one of them is different, but I'd have to say that most all of them perform their best on the air because they can be a different person than they really are. Mm-hmm. Most all of them are different on the air than they are in person to some degree because a different type of person comes when they get on the air. They're actors. When someone is hired to play a scene in a movie, do don't you think that there's a great deal of thought that goes on as to who they should hire? The same thing with a disc jockey. Uh, try to find somebody that uh, is unique, sounds different, grabs attention, that uh, respects authority. Mm-hmm. That's the boss. Sorry, but there is <laughs> one. And uh, and I was fortunate that my reputation preceded me. And in most places where I went, almost immediately the staff uh, welcomed me. And uh, yeah, the only problems I ever had as a consultant, and I consulted 31 radio stations, uh, was managers. What kind of advice would you give to aspiring DJs or program directors even? I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage anyone to go into radio. It's totally gone. It would be gone for me. They asked me why. I'd say I did not the radio I knew. It's totally out of the control of programmers. I don't want a sales manager coming to me telling me how to program because he's tainted. He's got salespeople. He's got clients. He's got other things he wants to take care of. My job is to make sure that don't happen. Really, honest to God, there's nothing new that's going to come on the radio. Uh, and I don't foresee the local concept on Local radio stations, I don't mean L.A., I'm talking about Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. If I had a station there, it would be 100% local. Local news, local everything I could think of. But they don't do that anymore. Why? Oh, because that would cost money. Someone has to even do that, don't they? With Mass America, you can't live out here in Mass America like I do and not continue to, uh, to, to understand what most people out here think. But we're not counted. There's nobody out here between uh, Chicago and and Los Angeles. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You mean there's people who live out there? <laughs> well, that's the way they think. I have a dozen friends that have become friends over the time I've lived here, and they're in their 20s and 30s. Okay. No 
what I've discovered is those that are in their 20s and 30s aren't Christians, necessarily. Uh, they don't put a great deal of religion in their thought. And neither do they. take a look at the research, what to show you. Same thing happening to the country. You know, way off religiously and moral and ethnic wise. Well, I came from the other generation. So I look at it, I think, same-sex marriage? Are you kidding me? Right. I mean, what's the Bible going to say about that? <laughs> but I, I'm not a tub thumper. I don't go to church ever. I've read the Bible once. I'm a firm believer, and I try to conduct myself that way. And uh, and, I, and and I realize others won't. Hey, there are people out there that kill somebody, you know, for anything. Seriously. So I look at it and think, well, there's all kinds of people out there. What would you consider the actual peak of your career? Peak. Well, the one where I had the most fun and enjoyed it the most, KFI. Why? No one bothered me. They did exactly as I wanted done. Uh, everything that I said I would do, I got done. It went number one. They knocked off the HJ. It was just... But, but besides, remember, by then I had I'd grown in my ability to program. <laughs> Over the year, you've, you you can't be the same programmer you were in Pittsburgh or even Chicago. Hopefully you've learned a little bit and uh, some new tricks. I did at KFI, and uh, it was really the fun. Now, what I'm known for, WLS. Right. And WCFL, where I had the most fun and enjoyed it the most, KFI. I had a great staff. Oh, what a great crew. 